I guess let us know now if you're not okay with us recording. Um, and then we will have this posted on our website. And so throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, there's a Q&A function. So be sure to put your questions in there. I will try to check it as I'm presenting, but I'm on my laptop. So the view, as many of you may know, when you're in presenter mode, sharing your screen, um, the Zoom features are pretty limited. It's hard to see um, the Q&A feature, but I'll try to keep an eye on that. Um, or I think maybe you can um, post a, a chat too. And um, Helen from the Institute for Sustainability is also the co-host today. So hopefully she can help uh, monitor, monitor the chat as well. So I think we'll get started. We have a, a decent group. People might still, still kind of um, be filtering in as we're going. But I just wanted to um, welcome you to the session. Today I'm going to be talking about raising and supporting butterflies at home. You know, we're all working from home, um, going to school online, doing everything virtually. So this for me has been um, like a nice little outlet and like therapeutic thing that I can do when I'm home that gets me away from the screen, gets me out in nature and feels like I have um, some greater purpose that I'm still contributing to the world. So I will say for me, this has been, um, I've been doing this for a few, a few years now, um, but it's something, especially, you know, during COVID and all the craziness of 2020, that's really helped me get through these times. So just a quick kind of overview of what we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to give you some background. I'm going to share how you can help. So after I go through kind of the sad um, some sad news, I'll you know, bring it back to the positive of what you, we can all do to help, um, how to convert your lawn into life, how to make connections with the community, and then raising butterflies at home, and then a, a, um, quite a bit of resources for you for future, um, you know, for you to reference in the future too. So as you may or may not know, pollinators are extremely important, and so we're going to be talking specifically about butterflies today. But I do want to make it make you aware that butterflies are pollinators. So they're not obviously when we think of pollinators, we think of bees, but there are many types of pollinators, including wasps, flies, beetles. Um, you know, this summer you may have been familiar with those wonderful giant green fig beetles that were around. They're also great pollinators. Um, so all of the food that we eat, you know, one in three bites of the food that goes into our mouths from produce is from pollinators. Um, so it's really, really important to support them. I mean, I really don't feel like it's minimizing it when I say that without pollinators, life as we know it would not exist. Um, they're just, you know, we heavily rely on them. We don't even realize it, but, um, you know, so this was this photo right here is actually from an artist in London and he's doing these murals and says, you know, when we go, we're taking all of you with us. And it's really true. I mean, we cannot, you'd have to hand, hand pollinating our food um, is just not feasible. So um, we really do need, bees and all other types of pollinators um, in our lives to be able to eat every day. So we should thank them for every meal that we have. Um, so I wanted to include this graphic in here because, you know, I was born in the 80s um, and I remember as a kid seeing butterflies all the time, specifically monarch butterflies. Um, and every summer I would go visit family in Colorado and my grandmother in Colorado loved butterflies. And so she, I think, helped um, instill in me a love for butterflies. But I really feel like I Took them for granted you know i didn't realize that this population would be declining but it wasn't until as i got older i realized that i wasn't seeing butterflies nearly as often um, and so when you start to you know do some research so this graph shows you so in the 80s you know when i was a kid um the, the monarch population in california specifically was 4.5 million which is about the current population of los angeles um, currently the, the last count that they did in california there's about 29,000 monarchs so you see that huge decline which is about the population of, you know, the small town of Monterey, California. Um, so if you see to scale, um, you know, this little circle on the right compared to this circle on the left in the last 30 years or less, um, has, it shows you the significant decline of the monarch population. And so a little bit of kind of giving you how important monarchs are as well. They're, you know, found all across um, North America. And so there's, when we talk about monarchs, there's really two different populations. There, there's the Eastern monarchs and the Western monarch populations. And so obviously we're, you know, on the, on the West Coast. And so most of the monarchs that are here in California stay in California. They migrate from just West of the Rockies um, to California in the winter. Um, but then all this Eastern population of monarchs, they go to Mexico every winter for their overwintering. They go to the, um, you know, for, to the warmer climate where they lay their eggs. And so there's usually about um, four or five generations of monarchs. And so it's usually the monarchs that we see in the spring and summer 
they only live a few weeks, like maybe two to three weeks. Um, but the monarchs that live in the winter, they actually can live six to nine months because um, they have to survive that whole season and wait to the spring um, for more, more food to be able to you know, mate and, and lay their eggs. So the winter population of monarchs is really special. Um, and they actually, something, you know, one reason why I also, um, that's something that I saw when I was researching this that really struck me is that only one to 4% of um, butterflies survive until adulthood. So you think of that, you know, there's only 29,000 right now. Um, think how many eggs are laid, but yet only one to 4% survive in the, in, to adulthood. So there's just so much that we can do to help try to bring those numbers up. Um, and those monarchs, I mean, think of all the odds they have stacked against them. I'll talk about some reasons of why their population is declining. Um, but, you know, they have to travel in the winter. They travel up to 3,000 miles. I mean, think how tiny a monarch butterfly is and how um, just extraordinary that is for them to make it all the way from the East Coast all the way down to Mexico. Um, it's just absolutely extraordinary. So think of all the food sources and things that they need to have along the way to help support their migration. So when I was talking about the declining numbers, this is from the Xerces Society. Um, they do account every Thanksgiving, that, which is like the monarchs in California, they migrate along the coast um, to their overwintering sites between, it's like between November and February. And so they do account every year around Thanksgiving. And so if you look at this blue line, um, that's the number of sites that have been monitored. So that's actually increasing while these green bars are the populations. And so you can see you know, from 1997, there's over a million that were observed during just this, you know, um, observation period around Thanksgiving. And then the last two years, like I said, the counts are below 29,000. Um, so this is really staggering. There, the estimates are that the population really is on the brink of extinction um, and that we need to get those numbers up back to like, um, you know, over a million or more to, for the population to have any chance of survival. So it's pretty, pretty, um, Grim, grim, I would say for the for the monarchs, and you know, I will say too that I am focusing on monarchs right now because they really are a flagship species for, or a, a flagship for the um, butterflies. So we talk about monarchs, but by supporting monarchs, we really are supporting all different species of butterflies and um, pollinators in general. And so monarchs, I think you know they're kind of the most well known, most most recognized. Um, when you see a monarch, everybody can recognize a monarch. Um, and so by supporting them, we're supporting all species of butterflies. But, um, you know, for this talk, because the monarchs have, there's so much research specifically related to them, and we know a lot about their migratory patterns and their populations. That's why I'm focusing on their declining numbers. Um, so some reasons for their decline is habitat loss. So as you can imagine, development, you know, we used to have a lot of um, large open fields. A lot of those are being placed, replaced with, you know, commercial or residential um, developments, as well as agriculture. So, you know, when you have a monocrop, um, there's obviously no room for the host plants that the caterpillars need um, to eat and that the butterflies need for nectar. Um, so then those plants get removed and, you know, replaced. Um, also in the overwintering grounds, so I mentioned, you know, all the eastern population, they travel to Mexico. Well, there's a lot of illegal logging that's been happening in the forest that say that they migrate to, um, which, you know, that's destroying their habitat. And so there's no place for them to overwinter. They're having to find new places to go. Um, you know, obviously with the decrease in numbers, there's less of them, less habitat that's needed, but there's also that provides less habitat for them to reproduce um, and, you know, lay their eggs as well. Another big contributing factor is pesticides and herbicides. So, you know, going back to crops, there's a lot of pesticide use um, that's sprayed on our conventional agriculture. A lot of this, it's called unintended drift, where the pesticides spread, you know, through wind or other means into these natural areas that surround um, th these farmlands. And so obviously that um, affects it. You might have actually heard, I think it was only a few weeks ago in Fargo, um, North Dakota, there was thousands of monarchs. So the second picture right here is a photo that somebody took because overnight um, the vector control sprayed for mosquitoes. They were having a huge problem with mosquitoes in Fargo, as you know, many parts of the country are. Um, and so overnight they sprayed for mosquitoes and then everybody woke up the next morning to thousands of dead monarchs because the timing was just, you know, when they happened to be passing through um, that area on their migration. And it, you know, it's so um, pesticides don't differentiate between species. They're not just like, oh, here's the spray for mosquitoes. Here's the spray for cockroaches. It 
kills anything and everything in its path. So that's a huge thing to consider when I talk about things that we can do as well. Um, but pesticides, you know, have a very negative impact on butterflies and all pollinator species. And then also climate change, as you may know. So when we're talking about these migratory paths and temperatures are changing, that disrupts their natural, um, you know, evolutional, um, evolutionary instinct of knowing where to travel to because if temperatures are changing, um, if also the food that they feed on is being disrupted, if there's less water and rising temperatures, then the food that they're relying on to survive is no longer surviving. Um, then of course that has an impact on their survival as well. I'll talk more about milkweed. So um, monarchs specifically can only, the only plant that they lay their eggs on that they, and that they, um, caterpillars, the larvae um, eat is milkweed. And so you hear tons of people saying, you know, plant milkweed, plant milkweed, which yes, we definitely need to do. Um, but there's been a gr lot of growing body of research showing that um, non-native milkweed, specifically tropical milkweed, which is this one in this picture, um, has actually been detrimental to the population because in California, even it's, you know, it's used to a tropical climate. And so it doesn't, the plant doesn't die back in the winter. And so then it's providing food year round for the monarchs when they should be migrating. Um, and then it also gives it more time to harvest, um, to harbor different parasites. And so then it's actually causing um, monarchs to become sicker because these parasites can, you know, survive on the plant over winter. Whereas if you have a native milkweed, and it, there's parasites that get on the plant, then over the winter, the plant will die off and so will the parasite. Um, so they're finding that this tropical milkweed is actually, um, you know, causing more harm to the species than good. So I'll talk about that more when we talk about things that we can do as well. And then I included this photo here. So lack of nectar sources. This is, you know, you picture keeping up with the Joneses and, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side. So we're all trying to keep up with our neighbors and have these green grasses, but you know, you have this expansive lawn that honestly doesn't um, support any, any life, any wildlife. And especially if you're using pesticides and herbicides to keep it all uniform and green and pretty, um, you know, putting all these unnatural chemicals on our yard, um, but it doesn't, doesn't support any life. And so, you know, butterflies and all pollinators need nectar sources. That's their food. That's what they um, thrive on. And so when you have all of this green space, which I guess looks nice, um, but it's, it doesn't provide any food for the monarchs. So that's you know, another odd sect against them. So I included this here because something to keep in mind, you know, kind of going back to junior high science class, um, is when we're trying to support butterflies, that we have to support their whole life cycle. So you know, they lay the egg, which turns into the caterpillar, they form a chrysalis, and then the butterfly emerges. And so you have to have in your yard, things that support each of these different life cycles. And so this photo here of the butter of the, um, this is a monarch caterpillar. It shows you that it's about, depending on the time of year, um, it's like nine to 14 days from when a, um, when the caterpillar egg will hatch um, to when it um, forms into a chrysalis. And so this process is a little bit slower in the cooler months. So like in the fall, it takes a little bit longer. In the summer, it's really quick. Um, but so just that's just something to keep in mind, um, you know, when you're planning to support them that you're not just supporting butterflies, you really are supporting, um, you know, places for the butterflies to lay their eggs, food for the caterpillars to eat, and shelter for the chrysalis so that because the um, caterpillar stays in the chrysalis for about 10 days as well. So you need to make sure that there's a safe place for the chrysalis to be um, before the butterfly can emerge. So what can we do? So, you know, that's a lot of kind of doom and gloom. Um, so some really important things that we can do is obviously preserve habitat. So if you know of, um, you know, native places that have, you know, milkweed or other native plants, try as much as you can to preserve it. Um, in our own yards, try not to use pesticides as much as possible. Um, in the end, in our resources page, I included a link to natural, um, like integrated pest management, other basically alternatives to pesticides that you can use in your garden to, um, you know, you reduce the use of pesticides and herbicides. Um, and then plant caterpillar host plants. So I'll, I'll talk more about that. But basically, these plants have co-evolved with these different species of butterflies and caterpillars. And so many of them can only eat very specific types of food. And so um, there's some caterpillars that can eat three or four varieties, whereas the monarch can only exclusively eat milkweed. So that's why milkweed is so important. Um, it's literally crucial for the survival of the monarchs. Um, and then planting adult nectar sources. So these photos here, this is from my own yard. 
Um, this large plant right here, that's a white sage, which is native. Um, but I, and pollinators love it. I mean, every time I walk by this plant, it's buzzing with bees, but I haven't seen many butterflies on it. Butterflies tend to, to prefer um, bright colors and then see how, so this is a pincushion at the top and this is a coreopsis at the bottom and see how it's like, looks kind of like a landing pad. Um, butterflies seem to prefer, prefer flowers that have like a, a soft place for them to land where they can, um, you know, do their nectaring. Um, and then planting natives, which even if you're not supporting butterflies, there's just so many benefits to planting natives. I mean, it reduces water because the plant is already adapted to that climate. So you need, you know, it takes less resources to keep it alive. Um, you don't need to use pesticides or herbicides because there's no, there's generally not as many pests that are going to target that plant that's, you know, naturally evolved for that area. It's much more low maintenance. And then of course you're inviting the wildlife and supporting the local ecology. Okay, so this I wanted to include, um, this is really, really like effective, I would say. Um, it's pretty amazing actually. So when I, you know, I've been in the house that I live in now for about five years. And when I moved in, I never saw a butterfly. And then slowly over the last five years, I've been planting these plants and all of these butterflies have been, and caterpillars have been showing up in my yard. So it really is like, if you plant it, they will come. Um, so this is a handy chart to see like, you know, if you have a favorite butterfly or if there's a plant that you already have, you might already be supporting um, different, different butterflies. Um, so if you look, so um, let's see, uh, the third one on here is the Gulf fritillary. So this is a, a butterfly and caterpillar that I support in my yard. So their flowers are beautiful. If you can see the second flower um, for number three, that's the passion flower. It's a gorgeous flower. It produces fruit as well. And literally I planted it less than a year ago. My plant is just taking off. Um, it's doing amazing. And I see these gulf caterpillars every, every single day. Um, ca caterpillars and butterflies every day. They, once they find the plant, it's like um, they just tell all their friends and they keep coming. Um, yeah, so and then the monarch, as I mentioned, the milkweed. Um, painted ladies too. You may have remembered we had a migration of them. They came through, I think it was last fall. Um, and so their, their host plant is thistles. And so you, I've seen a ton of those in my yard too. Um, they also, for nectar plants, they love my lantana. I have a lantana, which is not native, um, but it's also not invasive. And so um, the butterflies definitely love the lantana as well. Okay, so as I mentioned, you know, those different life cycles that you have to support. Um, so for the caterpillars, I mentioned some of the host plants. So obviously the butterfly, once it reaches adulthood, it, that's the way that it eats and, you know, provides nourishment is through nectar. And so these are, so one thing that's really important to have in your yard is different plants and flowers that bloom at different times of year. Um, so obviously I mentioned again, you know, if you, if you take one thing away from this presentation, it's that natives are ideal. Um, natives are super important. Um, so at the top, you will see, so milkweed, I mentioned, these are two different um, varieties that are native to Southern California at the top. Um, in the middle, this, this really pretty white and pink, this is a photo from my yard too. Um, it's yarrow, the butterflies love the yarrow, um, California buckwheat as well. Um, and then I did include a few non-natives that are just butterfly magnets. I have these in my yard too, and the butterflies love them. They provide great nectar for them. Um, so these are Cosmos, these pink one, and then um, the one next to it is the coneflower. They're just gorgeous to look at, and they're, like I said, magnets. So if you plant those, um, you, know, you will definitely, definitely have butterflies in your garden. So I wanted to show you, um, you know, I'm not a, you know, gardener. I'm not a naturalist. I'm not a, you know, conservation biologist. Um, this is just something that I'm passionate about and interested in. Um, and so I wanted to show you that it, it doesn't, you know, take any specialized skills. Like there's plenty of resources online um, to help you do this for yourself. So I wanted to share with you the conversion of my front yard um, to show how it really can be done, you know, on, on a pretty small budget um, and, you know, by people that aren't experts. So like I said, I, I've been in my house for about six or five years now. Um, so this first photo was 2016, that's when I moved in, you know, had this standard American lawn, like everybody and like all my neighbors. So you can even see my neighbor in this photo, he has a standard American lawn as well. Um, and then once we converted our lawn, he converted his too. So it definitely is something that spreads. Um, 
And so this is a photo I'm going to share at the end to the different nurseries that I really like. But so this is we went to the nursery, you know, filled the truck up with all of these plants, um, brought them home, kind of mapped out where to plant them, just kind of set them out in the front. Um, and then luckily, my husband's very handy. So he did all of the um, irrigation, you know, kind of help. I was I got to supervise that job of, you know, putting where the line should go. Um, and then we didn't even really kill our grass. You can see, you know, from this first photo to the one below it, um, we turned off the sprinklers for maybe a, a couple of months. It wasn't that long, but it was still, um, you know, surviving. There's still some green in there. And so as we put in the irrigation lines, we put, put down this weed paper. Um, it's just paper. You can do it with plastic as well. I just preferred not to use plastic. Um, but, you know, you just buy this weed paper from the hardware store, um, and then you lay mulch directly on top of it. And it works pretty well of, you know, killing the grass as well as keeping the weeds, you know, creating a weed barrier. Um, then you just, you know, keep a little bit of a um, clearance around each of the plants. So that was 2016. So this was the finished product in 2016 after we put in all our tiny, cute little baby plants um, and put a fresh layer of mulch down. And this was two years later. So just to show you again, there's my two little boys playing out there. Love it. They love finding all the caterpillars and all the wildlife now that's in our yard. So just to kind of show you, you know, 2016, 2018. Two years later, look at all those different colors and just how much life is in our yard. I cannot go out here without seeing, you know, a, a bee, butterfly, wasps, um, just so much life in my front yard. Um, and then, so this I wanted to show too. So this was 2018. This was this spring, May 2020, so two years later, and it still looks about the same with very, very minimal maintenance. Um, I mean, I go out there and, you know, if there's plants that aren't looking great, I'll, you know, give them a little bit more care. Um, we have this, so this large tree right here is a magnolia tree, so it drops ton of, a ton of leaves throughout the year, um, but we mostly leave them just to act as another layer of mulch and shelter for all the wildlife. Um, and then, you know, we trim some things back. So kind of one lesson learned, if you look, um, in this corner, like by this wall right here, these two plants right here that we planted pretty close to the wall and to the sidewalk. If you look here, how huge they are. Um, so those are Cleveland sage, which are native um, and their pollinators love them, but they get huge and they grow really fast. Um, and so one thing that we could have done differently is planted them, you know, not so close to the sidewalk. If we would have planted them back further, we would have been able to let them grow. Um, but obviously we have to keep those pretty well trimmed to, you know, keep the sidewalk clear. Um, but, you know, that's pretty minimal as well, just cutting that back. Um, and then these yellow flowers that you see in the front, these are chocolate daisies. Um, there's a lot of different varieties of native daisies that are beautiful. And these, I think we bought maybe four of them. And these um, self-pollen or self-seed, and so their seeds just spread really easily. Um, so you can see in two years, like see this was 2018, how there's like a few little patches of them. And this is still mostly mulch. And then two years later, these daisies without us, even, you know, saving the seeds and germinating them and planting them, um, doing no work at all. Um, they just spread themselves because we have birds, our, our yard's covered in birds too. So obviously the birds help spread those seeds as well. So the other thing I wanted to show you that's important when you're, you know, thinking about doing, you know, gardening for wildlife and for pollinators is that it doesn't, you know, obviously spring is when all the flowers are blooming, everything's beautiful. This, I took this picture yesterday. So you can see in September, it's not quite as pretty as maybe a green lawn would be. You know, most of the flowers aren't blooming anymore. Um, we had a lot of, you know, days where we had, you know, 100 plus degree temperatures. So obviously that had an impact on it. Um, but I would say mostly everything is still thriving pretty well. You know, everything's still um, green-ish. Um, so it, it, it does, you know, it's, it's definitely change in perception of you know, what a pretty garden looks like. Um, it's not always, you know, obviously, ideally, I would love it to always look like this, but that's just not realistic for the seasons. You know, we, we have different seasons and these plants don't all bloom year round. And so while we do still have some that are blooming, you know, it's just something to keep in mind. Um, you know, if you, if you go on Pinterest or whatever, you see all these beautiful gardens, but there is, is you know, it does take a little bit of getting used to. We, I have got some side eyes um, from neighbors and things when they walk by and, you know, this, this Cleveland sage gets kind of unruly. Um, but it's definitely a, a, like a learning point too. We've had tons of conversations with neighbors um, constantly about our front yard. So these are just some of the plants that we have in our front yard too um, that I've seen are, you know, that um, have been pretty successful in attracting pollinators. So this top one is a different variety of verbena. 
And you can see that's one of the painted lady butterflies during the migration that landed on it. Um, we have poppies. I included poppies because obviously they're native, um, but these were started from a little seed packet that I got and I just threw some seeds in the ground, like watered them a couple times, kind of forgot about them and they've just been thriving. Um, you know, they're an annual, so they will die each year and then come back. Um, and they, you know, zero, literally zero maintenance. Um, this photo with the monarch on it, this is a lantana, which I mentioned is not native to this area, but it's non-invasive. It grows really easily. It's super low maintenance. Butterflies and bees love it. Um, the passion flower that I mentioned, so this is the passion flower. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous flower. The plant grows really easily as well. Um, this attracts those gold fertilaries that I mentioned. Um, here's a photo of the Cleveland sage and the chocolate daisies. These are two plants that I would highly recommend if you're, you know, want to even just start with a couple, like one or two plants. Um, these are two that have done really well in our yard and that just are magnets for all the pollinators. Um, so some more gardening tips. If you're, depending on where you live, you can look online. So the USDA has different hardiness zones and so that you can put in your zip code. It's like a really easy interactive map. Um, and you plug in your zip code and it tells you what your zone is. And so when you're you know, shopping around for plants, it will tell you which zones the plants do well in. So make sure to know your zone. So my zone, if you live, you know, I'm in Chatsworth. If you're you know, in the Northridge area, you're most likely in zone 9B. But if you, you know, live somewhere else, um, definitely check what your hardiness zone is before you purchase plants. And then as I mentioned before, definitely try to buy plants that bloom throughout the year, you know, different, time, different seasons um, so that there's always a food source um, for the host plants for the caterpillars, as well as the nectar sources for the butterflies. Um, and then, as I mentioned, changing your perception of what a garden should look like. You know, it's not always going to be, um, you know, blooming like if you have roses or even a green lawn. You know, you might always, it might be consistent, but it's not supporting any life. Um, and then it's always good to plant in clusters too, because that provides a lot of shelter for plants. And then if one plant doesn't make it, there's, you know, or if it's not blooming, there's, always, there's something right next door that is blooming. Um, so I found that planting in clusters, it just looks more attractive too. If you have just a lot of like bursts of color together, it's really pretty. And then plant things at different heights. So if you can see in this top corner right here, this is our passion vine. Um, and this was when I moved in, I don't have a before picture, but this was just, you know, a bare wall of the house. And we just put up this really cheap, easy lattice. And then I bought one passion flower plant that in less than a year, now I, I should have taken a um, current picture. This photo was a while ago, but now this whole um, lattice is completely covered with the passion flower, the passion vines. Um, and so that's, you know, growing, you're creating all of that much more height um, for the caterpillars to climb because um, then they're, they're less, um, vulnerable to certain predators that may, you know, be on the ground. Um, it just they, it gets different sunlight, even different climate. At the at the bottom, it's you know a little bit cooler than it is at the top. Um, so just try to think. Don't think of everything as like linear on the ground. Definitely play with different heights within your garden. Um, and then so you can see in this photo with the chocolate daisies, I, I mentioned our magnolia tree. So see these leaves here. Some people might think it looks messy, but I actually have grown to love it just because it's such a pain cleaning up a, a magnolia tree. Um, and it provides, you know, once those leaves break down, um, they provide nutrients back into the earth. And then they also provide shelter for all of these different animals that we're um, trying to support. Um, and then having a water source is really important too. Um, so I have, here's a picture of, you know, a, a bird fountain, but if you put little stones or pebbles in it, then that helps insects be able to use the water too, because if you just have you know, a deep bowl of water for birds, then insects can drown if they land on it. So if you put just, you know, some little pebbles or stones, um, then I see all the time, every time I look at mine, there's usually wasps and bees in it. I haven't seen butterflies too much, um, but you know, then wasps and bees can get their, their water as well. Okay, so I had mentioned before, if you plant it, they will come, but it's true. I just kind of want to show you the different stages of life and give a little plug for the Sea Sun Garden as well. So if you're not familiar, um, the Institute for Sustainability, we have a garden up on, you know, nobody's on campus right now, obviously, but um, Northeast campus, it's, you know, just south of Northridge Academy High School. And we have a pollinator garden that we partnered with facilities planning on to plant, um, plant you know, a host of different plants that are native and um, provide food and um, shelter for different pollinators. And so I was there one day and I thought it was pretty cool because I saw, so this first photo is um, a monarch caterpillar egg on a leaf. Here's a caterpillar, you know, just resting. Um, 
and then here's a chrysalis. So, and then I had a photo of the of a butterfly there too, but you can't. It's really hard to get a photo of a butterfly that shows up well, especially on a PowerPoint. Um, but so I saw, you know, all four stages of the monarch, you know, in one like walk by um, at the campus gardens, which is pretty cool. Um, and so I did want to show too. So if you look at this, the third picture, that's a monarch caterpillar when it forms its chrysalis. It's originally like this really pretty green color. Um, and then when it's getting ready to eclose or emerge, then it turns transparent. And so it looks like it's black and orange, but it's really that that outside um, covering turns clear and then you can see the butterfly inside. So that you can just see the kind of dramatic difference between um, that's the same species, same, you know, chrysalis um, when it's getting ready to open. Um, and then I mentioned too, um, so another um, caterpillar that I've been supporting is um, the giant western swallowtail. So they specifically like citrus and rue um, and I think parsley and dill. And so I planted rue and I already had um, a lemon tree and an orange tree at my house. It's just one of those things that I didn't even realize it was a host plant for butterflies until I started um, doing some research. And so this, um, there, this first the photo on the bottom in the second row, um, that's the swallowtail caterpillar. So they're, it's interesting because they're pretty hard to spot. They, you know, it kind of looks like bird poop or something where they, and they also resemble their chrysalis. So you could easily mistake it, you know, not for a living creature. Um, so that's what it looks like when it's in its, you know, the caterpillar form. And then here's a photo of one once it forms its chrysalis. And then once it closes this, you know, third photo on the bottom, that's the giant Western swallowtail, which is gorgeous. They're huge. They're um, like probably almost twice the size of a monarch. Um, so this was one that was just resting on the back wall at my house. Um, that must have, you know, done its whole, done the whole cycle um, in my orange tree um, and emerged because it was just, you know, resting there. Um, and then here's another a monarch butterfly as well. So I mentioned, let me just go back to this one really quick. Oh, and I see a few questions in the chat too. Um, okay. So I can go through these. Um, yeah, I might as well go through these now since we're talking about plants. So Lynn asked, do you prune milkweed? So you can, if it's native milkweed, you can prune it, um, you know, for aesthetics. Um, but if you do have tropical milkweed, which I, you know, definitely, like I said, it's not recommended to plant tropical milkweed, but if you already have some in your yard, which I already have some, um, like the National Wildlife Federation is saying that you don't necessarily need to pull your plants, but it's very important to cut them back every fall so that they um, mimic the same natural process that an, a native plant would. Um, so they usually say between um, Halloween and Thanksgiving, just to kind of have an easy reminder of when to do that. Um, so if you cut them back literally so that they're like three inches long, so you don't want any leaves to be available for the monarch um, or flowers for them to feed on, to lay their eggs on, for caterpillars to eat. Um, so yeah, if you have the native milkweed, you can just prune it for aesthetics. Um, honestly, I don't prune mine at all because then that's cutting, you know, food and nectar sources away from, from the caterpillars and the butterflies. Um, but that native, if you have the non-native, the tropical milkweed, I would definitely cut that back each year. Um, and then it will grow back in the spring, um, you know, in the, the natural cycle when it should come back. Um, how many plants do you need in any given space? Honestly, it depends on how much space you have, but Monarch caterpillars, you know, I don't know if you, any of you have kids or you remember the story from when you're a kid, but the book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, you know, I never really thought of the name of that book until I raised caterpillars. Monarch caterpillars are voracious eaters. I mean, they will eat, I mean, like a, in a so they're, if you go back to that, um, the photo that I showed of the caterpillars at the different stages, there it's called the fifth instar, like what they're the largest form of the caterpillar before it's going to form its um, the chrysalis. It can eat, I mean, like a whole stem of branches, like five to ten branches in a day easily. One caterpillar. Um, so think if you have, you know, I've had you know thirty or forty, um, you know, eggs being laid on my plants at any time. So I would basically, I know it's a long version, long answer, but I would say plant as much as you have space for, um, but also make sure that you're providing, like I said, the nectar plants too, for once that adult butterfly emerges, it's going to need um, food to feed on too. And milkweed plants, that's what's great about um, native milkweed is they also provide nectar. So you really, you're providing nectar and food for the caterpillars and the nectar for the butterflies. Um, yeah, so Richard, I should mention that Richard is um, on this webinar. He is our new resident biodiversity coordinator with the Institute for Sustainability. He's a graduate student in the biology department. And so 
Um, maybe Richard, if you don't mind, I, I haven't looked at the chat, but maybe you can put a link to that in the chat. So Richard is um, mentioning for people to, which is very important for people to check if plants are invasive before they plant them. Um, and so you'll see too on my reference slide, Richard, hopefully I should have ran it by you for approval, but the, my reference slide, I have links to um, different sites that recommend plants specifically for different types of caterpillars and butterflies and that are also native and so, you know, which, so being native, they're also water wise and non-invasive. So, um, but yeah, that's definitely a good point. And then something to consider too, is if you already have plants in your yard and you are, this is something that you really feel passionate about and you're getting into it. Um, I would check to see your existing plants if they're invasive and pull them out. I mean, I've done that with quite a few plants in my house that just weren't supporting life. You know, I had a, a lot of agapanthus at my house. I don't know if people know what agapanthus are, but they remind me of like, you know, what you'd see in front of a dentist office. They're just not, um, I don't know, they're not my favorite plant. Um, we also had, you know, some roses, which weren't my favorite either. Um, and I do feel bad pulling out a live plant, but then I kind of got over that and, you know, I looked at that space as potential to have much more um, plants that benefit, you know, the ecosystem um, much better than any of those other plants. So Lynn asks, can I raise monarch butterflies from my office balcony? I would say yes, if you have um, you know, any outdoor space. So milkweed does need some sunlight. So as long as you get some sunlight, um, then, then you could definitely do that. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more specifically about how to raise butterflies um, right now. So let's see. Okay, so if you want to go one step further, say you've you know planted all of these like different types of plants, you see now that it's working, you see butterflies come into your yard, you check, you see them laying eggs, you know, see caterpillars on your plants, you're really excited. So this is kind of how I got into raising them is because I you know started planting the plants and then I would see get so excited, I would see caterpillars, I'd go out the next day and the caterpillars were gone. Caterpillars were gone. And so that goes back to, you know, they just have so many predators. Um, I've seen wasps come right up and, you know, steal my caterpillars. And, and you may know that, you know, caterpillars are like one of the um, primary sources of food for birds. So obviously you're, it, you're, you know, supporting those other forms of life as well. Um, but it is sad when you're planting certain plants specifically for caterpillars and then you keep seeing them disappearing. So that's what led me to um, kind of taking it one step further to bring them inside, provide more shelter for them. Um, and raise them, you know, to, to adulthood. So I could kind of increase those numbers um, from that one to 4% up to, you know, 95 to 100%. So if this is something that you're um, considering doing is, you know, raising them in to, you know, to um, raise them to adulthood, then you definitely need a steady supply of host plants. So um, as I mentioned, the monarch caterpillars eat a ton. I've been this year um, raising the gulf fritillaries and the swallowtails, they eat less. So I'd say they have less of an appetite. It's definitely more manageable to raise um, those species. Um, you also need an enclosure. So these photos over here and in, in the resources page, I have links to where you can get these. Um, but it's basically a mesh enclosure because you want some airflow, but you want it so that predators can't get in so that they're protected. Um, so these are, these are great. You can, you know, there's a couple sites where you can get them from. Um, they're really affordable. Um, and then you want to, it's important, so you can either, so in this bottom right picture, you can put the whole um, plant, this is milkweed right here, you can put the whole plant in the enclosure if you want. Um, there are some drawbacks to this because there could be other pests that if, if, if this plant was outdoors, then there could be other, um, you know, aphids or ants or spiders or other, any type of predator to the caterpillar that are kind of hiding in that pot somewhere. Um, and it's, it's just not as sanitary if you want to keep it, you know, a real clean environment for the caterpillars. So um, that's one way that you could do it. But the way I prefer doing it is taking clippings from the plants and then you can either, um, so what I've done is that you can see in this photo, like you can take like an egg carton and then little flower tubes and you just put the clippings with water in there to keep them fresh. And then it's also important to keep the plants upright, you know, that kind of mimics their natural environment. If you lay all the clippings on the ground and then that's where the caterpillars that's what their poop is called frass. And so then, you know, all their poop goes there too. And so then they're like walking over where they're eating, which obviously isn't sanitary. Um, so you wanna try to keep it upright as much as possible. Um, and then yes, you can also use, you know, like little like sauce cups or these, you know, little plastic containers um, and just poke a little tiny hole in the top and put water in it um, with the clippings as well. Um, so that's different options. Um, so I will say that I did start raising monarchs first, but there are, um, Monarchs, I would say, are more high maintenance than other um, 
butterflies and caterpillars. So there's, they are ha more susceptible to disease, how I mentioned, um, you know, that parasite that um, is harbored on the tropical milkweed. It's called OE, it's a parasite. Um, and so it is like the best practice for raising monarchs is that you should be um, doing a diluted bleach spray um, to sanitize all of your equipment, even the eggs and the leaves um, to like basically eliminate that um, parasite. And so um, it's a, it is a little bit more work to raise monarchs. Um, so you don't necessarily have to bleach everything with other species, but um, it does keep everything cleaner. You, you know, you will have a healthier population if you do that. Um, and then I would recommend having a journal to keep just so you can kind of keep track of how many butterflies you've released, um, any issues that you've had with documenting. I literally just use, you know, the Google Notes um, function on my phone. I just type my notes in on there. Um, so don't, you don't have to have like a separate journal or anything. And then I included this photo here of the monarch to, so that you can tell the difference between, between the male and the female. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. because the So that's something I keep track of too, is how many males versus females I've released. And so these two black dots, if you look in the bottom photo, those two black circles right there, um, that's how, those are only on the male. And so this top photo is a female. So the female doesn't have those two dots and the male does. Um, so that's one way you can, you know, obviously track if you're releasing males or females. And then, um, so basically this is just kind of a step-by-step -step of what I do. So you need to obviously, to raise them, you need the eggs. And so you have to have some plants that are out in nature, you know, out in, um, in the natural environment. Um, that so that the butterflies can find them and lay their eggs on it. And so then you can just go outside, look for eggs. So you, they usually lay their egg on the underside of the leaf. And so you can go outside. Um, this first photo is of the passion vine where the gulf fritillary lays its eggs. Um, so I go outside, if I see some eggs, I collect them, you bring them inside. You can either you know, bring the leaf inside um, and put like a moist paper towel around the stem to keep it fresh, or you can put them in a plastic container. Um, and when they're you know, first, when they first emerge, they're tiny for like the first five or six days. They're, I mean, like so small, you can barely see them. So you don't want to put them in that mesh enclosure until they're at least about a week old. So, you know, when, if you get a mesh enclosure, you'll see the, the holes in it. You want to make sure obviously that the caterpillar is larger than the holes so they can't escape. And they are pretty good escape artists. I've found them, you know, kind of randomly wandering around my house before. So um, make sure you keep them safe and keep them in the plastic container um, until they're large enough to put into the mesh enclosure. And then you want to make sure that you're, you know, changing the water, making sure there's fresh water um, for the plants. The caterpillars don't need water themselves. They'll drown. You don't want to give them, you know, have any water source um, in your enclosure. It's just to make, make sure that the plants stay fresh um, and make sure that they have enough food. So if you have more than one caterpillar in there, obviously make sure you have enough food for more than one. It will stress them out if they, you know, run out of food. They kind of um, go into a stress mode and they can even kind of, you know, um, makes them more prone to disease and things like that. So you want to make sure you always have, you know, plenty of food for them. Um, also an important thing to note is not to disturb them if they're not moving. It's, you know, you can want, you can observe them. Um, you can touch them if they're active, but if they um, move away from their food source, usually if they're hanging vertically on the side, that means they're getting ready to molt. And so if you touch them, pick them up, move them during that, that process, then it can actually, um, um, like, prevent them from being able to molt properly. Um, so that's some, something that's really important um, for them. You know, they're growing, multiplying in size almost daily. And so you need to make sure that you don't disrupt that um, process. And then, so I included this photo, these two photos, the bottom ones, the bottom right, this is the Gulf fritillary. Um, so before they form their chrysalis, they usually climb to the top and then they hang what's in this, what's called the J position. So they'll hang upside down in this J and then it'll take them about 24 hours to form their chrysalis. And then they'll be in their chrysalis for about seven to 10 days and then they'll emerge. And so um, something else that's kind of best practice is to separate the caterpillars from the chrysalises um, because when other caterpillars you know, are roaming around trying to find a place to make their chrysalis, sometimes they'll unintentionally walk on a newly formed chrysalis and they can damage it, um, which will prevent the butterfly from being able to close properly. Um, so separating them after, once the chrysalis is been in there for about 24 hours, you can um, relocate them. Um, and then this photo of the monarch, I wanted to include this because when I first started bringing them inside and it, you know, the monarch came out, I was like, oh no, what's wrong with the monarch? It looks so deformed, but they come out, you know, they're in this tiny little chrysalis and so they don't have a lot of space, obviously. And so um, they're all crumpled up inside there. And so when they come out of their chrysalis, their wings will be 
you know, very small, and it takes them a few hours to kind of pump the blood throughout their body and for their wings to um, open and to harden. And so when, if you see the monarch come out like this, just give it some time. It's a really cool process to watch, actually. You can almost like watch their wings kind of inflate, um, you know, pretty rapidly. So um, it's pretty cool. But so I wanted to show you that so that people aren't alarmed if they do see a, you know, a butterfly emerge from the chrysalis. Um, it, it won't look like how, you know, uh, how, you, how you see a butterfly um, immediately. And then you do want to wait three to four hours. So it takes them some time for their wings to fully harden, for them to have the strength to fly. Um, so usually, yeah, usually wait three to four hours or they'll kind of start flutter, fluttering around in the enclosure. Um, once they do that, then, you know, they're ready to go. And then they can be released. I mean, you know, we have pretty mild climate here in California, so they can pretty much be released um, anytime, but you do want to make sure it's at least 55 degrees. They can't fly if it's under 55 degrees. Um, and then temperatures above 85 to 90 degrees, it's to, not recommended um, to release them. And then it's also recommended to release them at least a couple hours before sunset because they don't generally fly at night either. So you want to make sure they have, you know, some time to find where they're going to, you know, some, find some shelter of where they're going to rest um, in the evening. Um, so I mentioned community. So if you, you know, start getting into this, as I have, um, you know, you, you hear the saying, especially with sustainability, think globally, act locally. And I really feel like this applies so well to raising monarchs and providing habitat for monarchs. You know, when you see that, um, the map of their migration, you know, doing something on a local scale, but, you know, these butterflies can travel thousands of miles. And so you really are um, supporting, you know, something much bigger than within your backyard. I mean, it really is, you know, helping to increase the, support the population, hopefully bring their numbers back up. Um, and if you don't, you know, have a backyard, these, this is definitely something like Lynn asked that you can do on a balcony, um, in a parkway. If you live in a condo or an apartment, you can do it in any common spaces. Um, I have a few neighbors that um, are local that are live in condos and they, you know, between like all the different um, condos, there's like, you know, plants. And so they've just planted milkweed and nobody says anything, you know, or they can talk, you can talk to your association if you want to do, um, you know, be more formal, but, um, yeah, you can, you know, that's pretty, I think it's, there's a lot of spaces if you look around that have potential for growing um, milkweed and other plants that support pollinators. Um, you know, for me, my work is CSUN. So obviously I have a lot of, um, you know, I'm very fortunate to have a workplace where it's um, encouraged to plant um, these different plants. But, you know, if you aren't affiliated with CSUN um, or you have, you know, children or spouses that have other work sites, then you could talk to them about um, planting things at their work sites as well, um, school, rooftop, parks. I mean, there really is, you know, plenty of opportunity if you look around of places that you can plant these plants. Um, and if you want to take it one step further, so one thing, so this is a photo from my front yard. Um, I became a certified monarch um, way station. So this basically is just through um, monarch, way, monarch, I think it's monarch, monarchwatch.org. Um, you basically just have to provide photos and documentation that you have, you know, the host plants, that you have nectar sources, you have shelter, um, that you don't use pesticides, um, and then you can become a certified way station. And so you can do this through the National Wildlife Federation as well. They have like a certified wildlife habitat. Um, you can get certified for that too. And I, I will say this has been a huge conversation piece for neighbors now. We have this in our front yard. And anytime I'm outside, you know, looking for caterpillars or anything like that, people always ask me, oh, this is so cool. How did you do this? Um, so it's a great way for, and it's pretty passive too. If I'm not out there, I see people, like I'll be inside and I'll see people, you know, going up in the yard, reading the sign. Um, so it just, you know, provides extra um, education to your community too. Um, another thing that's really easy to do that I want to stress is that you can, um, you don't have to buy tons of plants. You can save seeds, you can share seeds. So this is a photo right here of a milkweed plant dropping its seeds. And so I literally go out there when I see the little seed pods getting ready to open, I just go out there and grab all the seeds and then you can germinate them for the next season. Um, and so you can share those with people, you can ask people for seeds. Um, so a lot of resources that I use are the are next door. I don't know if people are familiar with next door. Um, it's, you know, kind of like a social, networking app for your specific community. And so I actually have a neighbor on there who posted about offering milkweed seeds. And so she and I connected. And so now we have like, I think there's four or five of us in my neighborhood that already were all raising monarchs um, and without even knowing it. And so now we all connected that way. I mean, we share milkweed and seeds with each other and with other neighbors. Um, 
And then if people are on Facebook, there's a really, really active and like has thousands of people in it. It's a Facebook group called The Beautiful Monarch. And there's tons of educational resources on there. Um, you can you know, post photos of things. You can you know, just read through people's posts. Um, so many people that are active and passionate. So that's been a huge resource for me. Um, another great resource is Buy Nothing. And th so if you, they're mainly on Facebook too, but if you search like Buy Nothing and then your community. So like I'm in the Buy Nothing Chatsworth group and you can search that group and you can just put an ask on there. So you, you can say, I, I'm requesting milkweed seeds. I'm requesting, you know, cuttings from passion vine. I'm requesting citrus. You can post any, anything on there um, if some ever request and like nine times out of 10, I've posted something and there's a neighbor that has it and is willing to um, give it for free. So that's another great resource. Um, one, another great thing I want to mention if that's kind of, you know, more passive, just something that's fun to do is this winter, you know, we're, we're getting close to the overwintering season. As I mentioned, it's November through February. Go visit one of these sites. It's amazing. So the, this photo, this bottom photo, is a, it's not the greatest picture, but it's a picture that I took um, through a telescope at um, in Pismo Beach. They have a monarch overwintering site, um, a monarch grove, where it's just you know a grove of eucalyptus trees that the monarchs return to every year. Um, and I've gone four or five years, and the, the numbers are so much lower now than the first time I went. But there's just these clusters of monarchs in the trees. They just look like dead leaves until you look closely and you can kind of see them fluttering. Um, and depending on the temperature, you know, they'll be flying around. It's really, really amazing. So um, I would definitely recommend this winter looking for, you know, they're in Santa Barbara, they're um, Santa Cruz, Pismo, they're all along the coast of California. But so look for one of these overwintering sites and visit it. Um, it will definitely, I feel like, you, you give you a, a great appreciation for monarchs. Um, and then I mentioned too, so there's community science. So this is basically where you at home, especially since we're all you know virtual and remote right now, you can be a scientist from your own home. And so I mentioned um, on this group, Richard is on our group. And so he actually created a CSUN at home project through the iNaturalist app. So if you have the iNaturalist app, you can download it and search for that project. And it's basically, um, we can use it to map different native plants and things that are available around, um, around in our community. Um, and then the last one that I will mention is Monarch Milkweed Mapper. This is another like um, community science project where they're encouraging people to go online if you see either a caterpillar, an egg, a butterfly, um, even milkweed, if you see any of these you know, in your community naturally occurring, um, to go on this website and post a photo of it so that they can track where all of these are. And they're doing, you know, trying to make it a very robust mapping project. Okay, so Lynn asked if, are there opportunities for CSUN employees to get involved in a community garden at CSUN? So as I mentioned, the Institute does have a garden. Um, because of COVID campus, you know, we're not encouraging people to go to campus right now. Um, we do have students that are working in the garden um, almost daily. Um, but otherwise, we generally, yes, we do um, have a lot of opportunities. We're always looking for volunteers. Obviously right now it's a little bit trickier, but those community science, that iNaturalist project is a way that you can get involved. Um, we also were giving out seeds. We did a um, seed distribution program. So that's something you can get involved with. I would say for now, the best way to stay connected with us to find out about future opportunities is to follow us on social media um, and to subscribe to our newsletter, which I'll have a link to our newsletter, um, I think on the last slide. Um, but that way you can stay informed. Um, and then, you know, once campus reopens, once we're back, then yes, we would love to have you um, get involved with the garden. Okay, so this slide, don't try to take, you don't need to, I mean, you can take a picture of it if you want, but we made a website for it. I think Helen put it in the chat for you. Um, so these are just all the links. So I have, um, these are some websites that I use constantly for native plants. And so you can put in your zip code, you can even put in like the type of butterfly that you want, like, oh, I wanna um, support swallowtails. And then it'll tell you which plants are native to your area and which support those, those different types of wildlife. Um, so those first three are you know, kind of the first step where you wanna go and figure out which plants you want. And then two nurseries that I love are um, Theodore Payne Foundation, which is in Sun Valley. Um, and then the, I think it's Matahia Nursery in Moore Park. That's actually where I bought all the plants for my front yard. They're um, ex exclusively native and the owner, I can't remember his name, but the owner is super, super nice, super knowledgeable and friendly. He spent probably an hour with me helping me pick all the plants for my front yard. Um, 
So highly recommend um, reaching out to him or reaching out to that nursery as well after you have your plant list. Um, and then these are just some gardening tips. Here's websites where to get milkweed specifically. And then as I mentioned, you know, reaching out to local groups, they can be a huge support. So um, that's pretty much it. Uh, here's our website. I think, like I said, we have, you know, check out our events page on our website, follow us on social media, and then you can subscribe to our newsletter. Maybe I can put this um, link in our chat as well. But I'm going to stop there so that we have some time for questions. Let's see. Okay, yeah, so thank you, Richard, for putting the um, invasive plant link in there, the inventory. Let's see. Um, yeah, Calscape, so Richard mentioned Calscape. That's another great website. Um, yeah, you can do exactly, yeah, so it's really fun. I mean, maybe, maybe I'm weird, maybe it's just fun to me, but you can do these advanced searches where you can put in your location, the type of yard you have, you can put in like your type of soil, um, how much sunlight the area gets, um, you know, what you want your watering needs to be if you want, you know, I don't know why you would want high watering needs, but you can say, you know, specify plants with low to moderate watering needs, um, and then it will give you a list of plants. So it's really, really easy to use and super helpful. Calscape. Yeah, so Richard put a ton of um, great links in the chat. Hopefully you can all see those. We can add those to our um, library resource or the page that we created um, for the Butterfly Garden um, resource page that we have on the Institute page as well. And so I think that's all the questions. I'm sorry I can't see all your faces and um, hopefully that you have found this interesting and helpful and we will post the presentation and the recording um, on our YouTube channel. So maybe, Helen, I don't know if you happen to have our YouTube channel um, handy, but if not, if you just go to YouTube and search for CSUN Sustainability, it'll pop up as the first channel. Um, so you can search for us there. So somebody asked, um, what's the solution to clean containers when raising them indoors? So it's a ratio of three, a 3% bleach ratio. So I do like 19 to one. Um, of bleach. So 19 parts water, one part bleach. If you're doing using just not concentrated bleach, if you're using just, you know, standard bleach, it should be 19 parts water to one part bleach. And you can put it in a spray bottle and spray everything down. I usually do it outside, um, you know, so that's well ventilated area. Um, you can spray everything and then hose it down with water and let everything air dry. That's another really important part of it is making sure everything's dry before you bring it back in, because obviously if there's still some moisture, um, then it can, you know, have you can, you know, increase mold or things like that. So it's really important for things to air dry as well. So I do recommend if this is something that you are interested in getting two of the enclosures so that you can have one that's clean um, at all times and that you can put the caterpillars or butterflies in when you're cleaning the other one. So you always have one to put them in. Um, and then it is good practice to, like I mentioned, to have the caterpillars and the butterflies or the chrysalises separate. I don't see any other questions. Um, oh, thank you, Nikhil. So Nikhil put the, um, oh wait, I think that's just to the panelists. There you go. So our YouTube channel is um, in the chat. So yeah, feel free to reach out to me. I have my email address on here. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. You can also, we have a monthly newsletter. So if people are interested, we can have a section in our monthly newsletter about how to support pollinators and butterflies. Okay. Hearing. All right, thank you everybody.